Hello there, A-pushers. Welcome to a lecture on Chapter 37, The Eisenhower Era. You can see there is my contact, contact information, uh, my Twitter account, class website, email, uh, my YouTube channel, and if you want to access this presentation, there is the link to it. So let's go ahead and get started. We're going to start with post-war America. So when World War II is over, everyone always thinks that like after World War II was over, Everyone was pumped. Everyone was jacked. Um, you know, people were feeling good about things. But actually, there was a lot of anxiety when the war was over. Uh, you got to remember that the Great Depression was basically alleviated by World War II, and eventually, you know, the economy was ripping and roaring. But I think everyone really thought that World War II was what got rid of the Great Depression, and people were a little uncertain that you know it, it might return, and, and things might be just as kind of bad. So. Essentially, people are nervous, okay? And initially, when World War II does come to an end, um, there are some economic issues. Um, GMP falls a little bit, uh, prices go up uh, roughly 33%, um, there's some labor unrest, and so people are a little concerned. And I think the one thing that America does that is just amazing um, is they pass the GI Bill, okay? And the GI Bill is still around today. I think a lot of us recognize what that is. But basically what it's trying to do is put these 15 million veterans that are coming back from World War II and integrate them back into society. So the GI Bill does things like give our veterans unemployment benefits for a year, let them go to college for essentially free, um, give them cheap loans to build new homes. And all these things are going to build an incredible American workforce. It's going to stimulate the economy. For instance, all the new homes that are being built, that's going to spur the construction field. Um, colleges are going to expand. And so it's just a great example um, of some government legislation that actually has just tremendous um, benefits for American society. Okay. So that does create an economic boom from 1950 to around 1970. The American economy, for the most part, is ripping and roaring. I mean, we are crushing it. Um, Everyone's doing, for the most part, better. Um, we, we mean, clearly there are people that are poor, um, but even people who are poor are starting to see gains, not only economically, but also with social justice. So for the most part, some people call this the golden age of America, and to a certain extent it is. I mean, we have to recognize that some people um, were completely enjoying the benefits, but those people that weren't enjoying the benefits, during this time, uh, their lives are getting better. There are these inroads made, um, you know, into, you know, civil rights and equality for women. So it is pretty much a great time for America. Uh, we see America's income shooting up. Uh, we have 6% of the world's population, yet we have 40% of the world's wealth. We see 40 million new jobs being created in 1950. We see the shift from blue collar work to white collar work. We have an expanding middle class. We have all these new products coming out, like the cars and TVs. Uh, we're actually an oil producer at the time. We're actually the greatest oil producer in the world at that time. So we have lots and lots of cheap oil. So that's great. We have a kids going to school. Our farm productivity is skyrocketing. And another reason our economy is booming is now we have a permanent war economy with the Cold War um, you know, you know, in swing, we have a, a very huge need for these industries that create tanks and planes and munitions. And plus the space race has now started in 1950s. So now we're going to start investing in NASA and getting a man on the moon, getting people in our space and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so we have all this change and all this stuff going on, uh, throughout the, throughout this period of time. And it's just leading to, like I said, an economic boom for America for pretty much two decades. Okay. Another place where we see a boom, uh, is with baby making. Um, you know, millions of people put the family on hold, um, because of the great depression. I mean, economic hard times, people are kind of like, well, do we really want to have a family now? Obviously world war II uh, really made people put family making on hold, I guess to put it in a different way. Um, you have all these men that are overseas, men that traditionally would be part of some baby making if they were still at home. And so when people do return from the war, when there's a little more certainty in people's lives, America starts making lots of new Americans. Okay. Uh, and so from 1946 to 1964, we have what is known as the baby boom generation. Okay. And today the baby boom generation makes up 78 million, um, of our population. And if we have a country of around 315 million, that's kind of a big chunk. Okay. And so that's also going to be a huge boost to the economy with all these new, 
you know, babies being born, you gotta feed them, you gotta clothe them, you gotta entertain them with toys and all that stuff. So that's just gonna lead to another big boost for the economy. These are also gonna become productive workers in our economy. They're gonna, you know, support the American economy for the next 30 or 40 years. And so uh, they're, they're a very important generation in American history, okay? Um, another really interesting thing about um, America during the 1950s is we see a lot of conformity taking place uh, where there's a lot of expectations put on young people and that kind of builds up and in the 1960s we see people kind of challenging conformity uh, if you have time check out these two videos they're just fantastic one is on uh, are you popular the other one's on you know do's and don'ts of dating so check it out if you have time uh, they are incredibly corny but really funny um, let's see here we also see consumerism picking up again. So we kind of talked about consumerism a little bit in the 1920s, uh, but we also see it returning in the 1950s, obviously with Great Depression um, and also World War II. Consumerism kind of takes a back seat in America for obvious reasons with, with rationing in World War II and obviously the Depression. You know, people weren't really looking to, to buy. But in the 1950s, America really kind of picks back up and we basically get back into this consumer lifestyle that was started in the 1920s. You know, Americans are all about buy, buy, buy. We have all these new uh, products coming online, refrigerators, washers, dryers, ovens, shopping malls are becoming a part of uh, the American scene. Um, TV uh, comes to America for the first time and people get really into TV shows, like for instance, Leave it to Beaver shows the classic American family. And the interesting thing about Leave it to Beaver, and when you think about TV shows, most TV shows kind of glamorize things. Leave it to Beaver straight up showed, showed excuse me, what the American family was like. And if you've never seen it, it's super corny. Um, and it kind of shows you once again, I guess kind of the expectations uh, of the 1950s. You got a dad that works, you got a mom that stays at home. Um, so, it's really quite interesting if you want to check it out. We see America having fast food popping up now. You have McDonald's coming on the scene in the 1950s, starting to make Americans fat. Disneyland pops up. The Mickey Mouse Club is here. The Lone Ranger is here. And so TV is going to change America. And it's kind of interesting because right now we're in the midst of TV changing right now with Netflix and Hulu and you know iTunes. I mean, TV is, is in a very interesting transition period as well. Uh, we also see the car becoming a major deal uh, in America in the 1950s. I think it's really the heyday of the, the American automobile. Uh, by 1960, um, America is really becoming a car culture. It, it's not uncommon to see families having two cars per family. Uh, in fact, today, if you're watching this right now, it, it's not a, it's not you know unusual for Americans to have one car per person who can drive. So you have some families, I'm sure, where there's four or five cars per family, depending on how many teenagers are in that family. And with cars. We see a car culture developing. We see all these industries popping up to support the car culture, whether they're fast food, whether it's a drive-in movie theater. And so, like I said, America is really changing um, with the car. And once again, this is spurring a lot of economic growth as well. We also see um, American culture, uh, I guess, flowering in places where you typically didn't see it. You see Americans moving to the West. You see Americans moving to the South. You see a major demographic shift taking place in America during the 1950s as well. With air condition, uh, people are starting to want to live in the deep south um, and also in the west. Um, and so you see these states becoming more and more powerful politically because people are going there and people are flocking there for many reasons. Um, a lot of the reasons are there's a lot of jobs in the southern states and western states from oil and space and defense. And once again, Americans' economy is just rocking and rolling. I mean, check out that statistic there. America made up 6% of the global population, but they produce 50% of the world's products. So once again, America is just rocking it, okay? And we also see in the 1950s, sports um, become very, very popular. You have baseball, football's coming around, basketball's coming around, horse racing's still a big deal, boxing's still a big deal. And now that you have TV, sports are starting to be put on TV. And also it's kind of cool because with the demographic shift and people moving around the country, you also see the sports teams following them. So here you see two very well-known baseball teams today, the Brooklyn Dodgers, the New York Giants, actually shift to go to California because they're following the people. So the Brooklyn Dodgers are now LA Dodgers, the New York Giants are now the San Francisco Giants. We also see a lot of celebrities in the 1950s, and so that's one of the cool things about 
1950s culture is for the first time really you have these incredibly popular entertainers you have Marilyn Monroe here who's singing happy birthday to JFK which that gets kind of weird because they have this kind of weird relationship you have James Dean and Rebel Without a Cause who was one of the one of the first great movie stars in American history who tragically died in a car accident and of course you got Elvis Presley rocking it out down there uh, with nothing but a hound dog if you want to rock to it obviously you can open up the presentation and play the music okay some pretty timeless music look at that provocative dancing by the way it's kind of funny because this dancing right here that he's doing people thought that that was too provocative and they sometimes only showed Elvis Presley from the hips up and now we have Miley Cyrus twerking it right how things change right guys so anyways moving on uh, to the one of the important presidents uh, of this time uh, President Eisenhower is the president for most of the 1950s and so obviously you know his presidency is awfully important to the to the 1950s here. So let's real quickly kind of look at the highlights of the Eisenhower presidency and the pitfalls of the Eisenhower presidency. Okay, highlights. Eisenhower brings the Korean War to an end. That's obviously huge, okay? He does it. It's kind of interesting how he does it. He basically threatens atomic warfare, and the North Koreans and the Chinese are like, yeah, about that, we give up. Uh, he's very well known. Uh, perhaps his, his keystone legislation is the international highway system, so whenever you're driving on the highway, thank Ike. Um, he's also very well regarded for his kind of middle of the way approach to governing. Um, he's not far to the left. He's not far to the right. He just takes a very middle course uh, to governing. And typically presidents that do that are for the most part pretty popular. Um, you know, President Clinton of the 90s, you know, he was incredibly well liked. And many people suggest that the reason he was so well liked was because he took a middle of the road approach. Eisenhower is the same way. But that also kind of leads to criticism with Eisenhower. People say he was popular because he never really put himself out there. He never used his popularity to really get anything done. He was much more um, interested in basically social harmony versus social justice. And I see I have a typo there, so I'm sorry about that. Other pitfalls uh, of Eisenhower's presidency is when McCarthyism popped up, when Joe McCarthy was basically launching his second Red Scare um, you know, Eisenhower really didn't do much to stop it. He kind of just laid back and, and let it kind of run its course. He, he he could have come out and really kind of just gone against McCarthyism, but he just, like I said, he kind of just stepped back. Another, I guess, pitfall of Eisenhower's presidency is uh, his legacy. Um, you know, usually when you have a really popular president, you like to see kind of a, you know, being handed down to a successor. Um, and JFK, a Democrat, beats Nixon. And so a lot of people look at that and see that as kind of being um, one of the one of the I guess the the pitfalls of the Eisenhower presidency. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit more about these these issues later on. So let's continue on. Okay, so internet interstate highway system. Obviously, I don't talk a lot about that, but uh, I think we all recognize that highways are incredibly important to you know American culture and the American economy. You think about all the jobs that go into building this. It's going to spur economic growth. It's going to it's going to allow semi trucks to transport goods. It's going to you know, really affect American culture with a, with a good old-fashioned American road trip. I'm sure we've all been involved in a road trip where we drive, you know, hundreds if not thousands of miles across the country. And during that, you're like, I want to kill you. I'm going to kill my family. I hate my brother. I hate my sister. Your dad and mom are screaming at you. And you're just like, oh, why are we doing this? But then, like, you look back on it and it's like, yeah, that was kind of cool. You know, I can't wait to do that with my kids. Um, so that's kind of cool. The highways obviously allow that. Also with highways now, you, you, suburbs are practical, right? So now that people can drive 60, 70 in Illinois, 100 miles to 100 miles an hour to work, you know, people can live farther away from the city. So you see urban sprawl, you see suburbs uh, popping out, and that's obviously going to change the way Americans live as well. Okay, so let's get to the Cold War paranoia here. You know, one of the pitfalls of the Eisenhower presidency, like I said, is McCarthyism. Okay, it's definitely a black eye in American history. It's very similar to the first Red Scare. You know, people are freaked out about communism. Okay, so I don't think we need to spend a ton of time on this. But you basically see American intolerance in the 1950s. You know, Truman starts with his loyalty program, where basically they're checking out, they're looking for, you know, people who they suspect to be communist. You have Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. They're convicted of giving atomic secrets to the Soviets, which they did. However, um, it was not proved that they did and they were still convicted of treason and executed and that's important because in America when you get executed for a crime it's kind of important that you know the government can prove 
that you were guilty, not just that they think you were guilty. And so that's obviously kind of a uh, unfortunate thing, you know, in American history there. Um, we also see HUAC, the House Un-American Activities Committee. They go after Hollywood writers and directors who are suspected of being communists. It's led by Richard Nixon. Uh, the Hollywood Ten are these ten writers slash directors, Hollywood executives, whatever, um, that refuse to answer questions. Um, and they, they basically, you know, get kind of ostracized from, from that culture because of that. And so you see a lot of shenanigans going on in the 1950s. McCarthyism, you know, Joe McCarthy, Wisconsin, basically claimed to have a list of communists in the government. No one really knows if this was true. He probably was making it up. And he basically went after people who he suspected of being communist. He ruined many people's careers. He even goes after General Marshall of the Marshall Plan. And eventually people start to get sick of him, okay? But in the process, he makes people incredibly paranoid. But eventually he goes after the military, claims that some high-ranking generals in the military are communists, and eventually people are like, you know what, dude, you're crazy, and screw this, we're done with you, okay? And he basically just kind of goes off to obscurity and I think dies shortly after. So goodbye, Joe McCarthy. Here's some uh, interesting political cartoons um, of the Red Scare, so check it out. It's kind of funny. Here's one on uh, Huac, the Committee of Un-American Activities. Okay, another great thing about the 1950s is we see the civil rights movement beginning. So once again, I kind of talked about this in the, one of the first slides, how, you know, the 1950s is a great time for America, but a lot of people, you know, really aren't, you know, really enjoying a lot of the economic boom. But on the other hand, we see a lot of progress with social justice and equality in America. So in the South, you have all these Jim Crow laws, right? You have segregation, you have voter suppression, you have intimidation, you have all this horrible stuff going on. But in the 1950s, we start to see progress, and we start to see victories in the civil rights movement, right? In the late 40s, Jackie Robinson, I'm sure many of you guys have seen the new movie, 42, he breaks the color barrier in 1947. President Truman desegregated the military in 1948. And, of course, one of the most important Supreme Court cases um, takes place in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas, where it basically overturns Plessy versus Ferguson, and basically segregation is no more. However, it's going to take time to actually get this implemented. The southern states, especially the deep or dirty south, they basically refuse to integrate schools. And the Little Rock Nine, there's a picture of one of the people in Little Rock Nine. Uh, these nine students try to integrate a school. Um, the National Guard uh, in the southern state is called up to stop that. And Ike actually has to send in federal troops to make sure that these kids can go to school. All right. You have Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955. MLK comes on the scene. So you have all this really cool and exciting stuff taking place in the civil rights movement. And we're going to focus a lot more on this uh, in some of the next chapters when we get to the civil rights movement. So I know I'm kind of flying through this, but we're going to, like I said, just kind of move on here. All right. Anyways, we're going to spend a lot of time here on Ike's foreign policy. Well, not a lot of time, but uh, he, he, one of the great things about Ike is that, he, for the most part, he's a pretty good president when it comes to foreign policy. I mean, he's a great president. Um, you know, for the for pretty much everything he does. But anyways, let's look at some of the things that Ike does, okay? Uh, he basically relies on atomic bombs. I mean, he thinks atomic bombs are the ticket, okay? Have a lot of nuclear weapons and basically scare the crap out of your, your enemies, okay? So what's he going to do, all right? If anyone messes with us, he's going to say, hey, massive retaliation, you mess with us, I'm going to nuke you, okay? The only problem with that is you're really not going to, you know, lead to World War III and nuclear annihilation over minor issues, okay? And that becomes very apparent when the Hungarians uh, basically try to throw off Soviet control and the Soviets just crush them and America does nothing. Um, and so it, obviously there's, you can kind of see this a hole uh, in, in Eisenhower's policy there. Eisenhower is the first president to get us involved in Vietnam. So we start to support the Vietnamese, South Vietnamese after the French were overthrown, and obviously presidents after him are going to continue to escalate that until a full-scale war erupts. There's also a, a major crisis in Egypt um, that Eisenhower does a great job with. Uh, the French and the British are basically about to invade Egypt, and they actually do. And Eisenhower basically says, look, we're not going to have you guys do this. Uh, we're not going to have you guys threaten uh, any kind of world stability. So basically, back off. And the French and the British are forced to back off. And, you know, a major crisis that could have led to a major war is averted, okay? Uh, with that, 
Eisenhower pledges to basically support any Middle Eastern nations threatened by communism. And this becomes known as the Eisenhower Doctrine. So here you can see Eisenhower is actively taking uh, a leadership role in the world. Okay, and that's one of the things that, you know, he, he's big on, is that America should be a leader, okay, in the world. Um, we also see under Eisenhower the space race begins. Um, Sputnik gets launched in 1957. People are freaked out that we're behind in the, in, in the space race. And that means that if the Soviets have better rockets, they can lob nuclear weapons at us, and we better start doing something. And so Ike creates NASA in 1957. Um, and basically the space race is on, and that's going to obviously culminate with America landing on the moon uh, about 12 years later. Okay, Some kind of downers, I guess, foreign policy-wise with Ike that we see going on. Uh, Cuba becomes communist. Okay, um, Fidel Castro overthrows the American-backed government under Batista. And that's become more of an issue of JFK, and we'll talk more about that later. We also see, unfortunately for Ike, he, he's looking to really kind of tone down the rhetoric, the, the rhetoric with the Soviet Union. He's looking to, you know, like I said, essentially stop the Cold War. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, one of our U-2 spy planes gets shot down in 1960, and the Soviets find out that we were spying on them, even though when we said we weren't. And that's kind of awkward, and that's going to really hurt any chances for us to really make any gains with the Soviets. And so for the most part, Eisenhower is a really great president when it comes to foreign policy. I mean, to be fair, that's his background being a, you know, a general in World War II. Um, so lots of really good things uh, for Eisenhower. Obviously a couple, you know, mistakes. But for the most part, a really competent and able foreign policy president uh, was Eisenhower. Okay? So anyways, Eisenhower has a, you know, uh, for the most part, a pretty good presidency. I mean, you know, most historians rank Eisenhower in, in incredibly high. Um, he does a lot of good things. Was he a perfect president? No. Uh, like we said, he had a lot of popularity. He could have used that popularity to get some stuff done, and he didn't. And, you know, that's unfortunate because, you know, presidents that have a lot of popularity can usually push through some pretty important legislation. You know, weak presidents can't push through legislation. Powerful presidents can't. And so Eisenhower steps down. And like I said, for the most part, pretty great presidency. One of the things that Eisenhower is concerned with when he does leave is he warns against a, a huge military complex developing in America. And he warns America of that, that we, we shouldn't have this huge military complex and stuff like that. So he's always known for that. So anyways, um, that's it for today, guys. If you're still with me, if you stayed with me for the 20-odd minutes that I, that I yelled at my computer,